kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. And they ran concurrently until he sinned. When he sinned, he became a fallen creature. A fallen creature cannot reign over the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he showed up, took the reins once again of the kingdom of God and also of the kingdom of heaven. And for three and a half short years on this earth in his ministry, when he ministered, he ministered with the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. The reason he did is because he offered the kingdom of heaven to the Jewish people at the Sermon on the Mount when he came to them as the Mashiach or the anointed of God. He was coming with a visible, physical kingdom. When you look at the book of Hebrews, look at it very carefully, and here's what you'll notice. You'll notice the book of Hebrews starts out with an earthly tabernacle, an earthly worship of an earthly people. All of their blessings and all of their relationship with God is built on an earthly basis. Everything was earthly. The first man of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. So Israel had an earthly kingdom. They had an earthly tabernacle, which became a temple. They had an earthly religion. Everything was earthly. They could, the, the average Jew or Israeli could only approach God so close. He could only get so close. And that was it. The outer court was as far as he could come. He couldn't go any further than that. He could not approach the holy place or the holy of holies. That was for an elite few. The priest, then the high priest, only one could go into the holy of holies. But the book of Hebrews lays out step by step how that now anybody, whether they are a Jew or whether they are a Gentile, if they are in Christ, they have access now into the very holy of holies that they have access into a tabernacle that is not on this earth, but a true tabernacle that is in heaven. That they have been get, given great blessing and privilege because now everything is, has shifted from an earthly people and an earthly tabernacle to a heavenly tabernacle and a heavenly people. Our citizenship is in heaven. That's where we, that's where we live. My life is hid with Christ in God. You see, I, the Bible says plainly in Romans 8 that the Spirit quickeneth this mortal body, the Holy Ghost keeps this frame alive as only a temporary abode. The apostle says in, in, the, in the book of Corinthians that we, we look for our house which is from heaven. So they had an earthly tabernacle and earthly people uh, worshiping God as they understood him in an earthly sense. Notice in the book of in the Old Testament, was there any promise of heaven? Did you find anybody going to heaven? Was there anything about heaven? Was there anything about a heavenly tabernacle? None of that. But when you get to the book of Hebrews, it all shifts. Why does it shift? Because it's not about the kingdom of heaven. It's about the kingdom of God now. The Lord Jesus Christ came and established the kingdom of God in himself. And all of you that are born again, you have immediately been placed into the kingdom of God. It doesn't come by meat or drink. It doesn't come by observation. It's not something you can touch. It's not something that you can build physically with mortar and brick. The kingdom of heaven is a kingdom that only the redeemed can enter into. Yeah. He said, except you be born again, you cannot even what? You can't. You are, you are, it's a, there's a wall that separates you from that kingdom. So now what happened? Well, here's what happens to understand the coming of the Lord. When he came to his earthly people, he offered to the Jew first himself as the Mashiach. He wanted them to understand his credentials as the Mashiach. The Lord Jesus progressively revealed himself to them. When he came to the Jewish people on this earth, they weren't ready for the second person of the Godhead. They were ready for a Messiah, the Anointed One, the Mashiach. They were ready for Him. They were ready for somebody to deal with an earthly kingdom, to re without, this time, without this time restore to us the kingdom. What kingdom do you think He was talking about? When He asked that question, do you think He was talking about a heavenly kingdom or an earthly kingdom? Well, of course He was. <laughs> exactly. The perpetuity of His throne. And this is what it talks about in the book of Acts when he says, I will come, come again, restore the tabernacle of David, which is broken down. No, he wasn't talking about a heaven. They weren't talking about a heavenly kingdom being restored in the book of even in Acts. 
when they said, well, thou at this time, he said, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons. What are they talking about? They're talking about the kingdom of heaven on this earth. And that's not what he came for. He came to be the savior of mankind, but they had to understand who he was. You see, when you're born again, you're not born again by some non-distinct, some, 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 uh, some esoteric, some thought, some, some idea. You're born again by a person. And when you're born again, you receive that person. And when you receive that person, you receive all there is about him. If there's ever any doubt in your mind about who he is and what he accomplished at the cross and all of that, you'll never receive him as your savior. You may want, your, you, you may want some temporal fix for your problem, but that's not the issue. The issue is Christ. So he came to these people. He came to them as the Messiah. And if they had understood that Old Testament, Hebrew, the book of Isaiah 9, for example, for unto us a, what's it say? For unto us, for, you know, everybody's going to celebrate it here in a few, few days. For unto us a what? All right, now notice the wording carefully. It's very important. For unto us a what is born? A child is born. A son. Not born given. The Lord Jesus Christ did not become the Son of God at His birth in Bethlehem of Judea. The God-man, where God and man merge together as one. It's important to understand, man, man did not come down from heaven. The God-man did not come down from heaven, but the God-man went back to heaven. The second person of the Trinity came down from heaven. Yes. The Lord Jesus Christ, that eternal being that has been from everlasting to everlasting. Creation originates from the Father, but is applied by the Son through the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay? This is why the Bible says, of Him, talking about the Father, and through him, talking about Jesus Christ, are all things. It says that over and over again. Of him, of the Father, through him, through the Son, are all things. Now think on that for a moment. Because it takes you into the Godhead and you begin to understand what's going on. In Matthew he said, who do men say that I the Son of Man am? Some says Moses, some Elias, some Elias, some Jeremiah, one of the prophets. He said, essentially he said, he would have said to them, that's fine, that's fine. Because at the cross they said he cries out to Jeremiah or Elias, remember? When he said, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, remember? You remember they said, he's crying out to the one of the prophets. Well, that's all they knew. But who do you say that I am? Because the idea is, I want you to know something about who I am, but you're going to get it from the Father. And Simon Peter said, Thou art the Christ. Well, that's good. That's good. Is he the Christ? All right, so what is he then? If he's the Christ, what is that? That's the Greek Christos. That's the Greek form of the Hebrew Mashiach, which is the what? The Messiah, the anointed one, all right? Thou art the Christ. Is he the Christ? But then he took a step above that. He took another step up. The Son of the living God. Now, you say, well, preacher, Jews believed in the Trinity. Show me one place in the Bible that a Jew ever believed in the Trinity. In the Godhead as you understand it. One place. One place in the Old Testament. You've got, you got 39 books. No, no, no. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Hear you, O Israel. The Lord your God is one Lord, one God. But they could understand by reading the text that there's more going on with that one God than just what the mind can comprehend you see because you can see the spirit of God moving in the Old Testament you can see the angel of the Lord which for the most part is the Lord Jesus Christ who's the active agent the one doing the work the one doing the creating but the idea of God the Father God the Son and God the Holy Ghost is a New Testament revelation and here's why here's why in the Old Testament when the Lord Jesus Christ is manifested He's manifested so many times as the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord. All right. Is Michael the angel of the Lord? Well, it certainly can be. 
Gabriel the angel of the Lord? Why, certainly. But so many times in the Old Testament, when the angel of the Lord is mentioned, it's mentioned as the Creator. He's given the identity of one far above simply an angel. Why? Because God had not incarnated Himself in flesh. He could take on flesh, but He could leave flesh. Once He incarnated Himself in flesh, at that moment, then you have God the Father in heaven, you have God the Son on earth, and you have God the Holy Ghost moving about this earth. Then you have a distinct appearance of the Trinity, yet there's still just one God. All right? Israel had to understand that. They had to learn that. They had to receive that. And that didn't come immediately to them. The concept that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost make up the Godhead that Paul talks about in Colossians. That's so important for us to understand. Of Him are all things God the Father. Through Him are all things God the Son. By Him or the whole power. He does it by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the concept. How did it come? It came, first of all, by understanding the earthly kingdom of the kingdom of heaven. They rejected the king. When they rejected the king, they rejected the kingdom. When they rejected the kingdom, God turned from Israel, his earthly people. And at that very moment, he began to manifest that Godhead, that son, the son of God that would go to the cross. Because now it is no longer an earthly kingdom with an earthly people and the kingdom of heaven. Now it is the kingdom of God. And you must be born again into that kingdom of God. And there's only one who is fit and qualified to reign over the kingdom of God. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what I just gave you right there will help you greatly in understanding the Sermon on the Mount. They rejected him. They rejected the Lord Jesus. They rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. They rejected the kingdom. They wanted a kingdom, but they wanted it on their terms. They wanted freedom, but they wanted freedom on their terms. They wanted to get rid of the Romans, but they wanted to get rid of the Romans on their terms. Now, all these things they wanted on their terms. They wanted to build something with their own hands like Nimrod did, the first official rebellion, when Nimrod said, we're going to build a tower that touches heaven. It's going to be something that's man-made. And the Lord Jesus Christ would have no part of it. No part. No part of it. So this is where we come. When he called out his bride and began to call them out, he began to lay the foundation for what the Apostle Paul would preach later when Paul was called out. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are full of the Lord Jesus Christ, aren't they? It's all about him. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels, are full of the Lord Jesus Christ. But nobody ever interpreted him till Paul showed up. It took the Apostle Paul to interpret Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and lay it out in its dispensational order so that they could begin to understand what was going on. There was a conflict. And here's the conflict. When the early church started, it had two main leaders. One was Peter. The other was James. James was the Lord's brother. In the book of Acts, chapter number 15, read it when you get home, and you'll find that the book of Acts, chapter 15, is one of the most important chapters in the New Testament. Here's why. In Acts, chapter 15, a problem arose about circumcision and keeping the law of Moses. Certain Judaizers left Jerusalem and went to Antioch. They left Judea and went to Antioch. When they got to Antioch, they got up there and told the disciples, they said, now, except you be circumcised, According to the law of Moses, keep the commandments, you can't be a Christian. These Judaizers that came from Judea and went to, and went to Antioch were Christians. In the book of Romans, the latter part of it, Paul spells it out. He said, one man esteemeth one day above another. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind, so forth and so on. There's nothing that ever says that they weren't true Christians, but they would not turn loose of Moses and the law. So what happened? They sent Paul and Barnabas down from Antioch to Jerusalem. And they had the first council in the Christian church, the very first one. It was held in Jerusalem. And at that council, the apostle Peter stood up. And he says, i got to tell you something. He said, God hath showed me how 
that even a Gentile, and he was talking about his trip to the house of Cornelius, can be saved just like us. And when he was saved, there was no law, there was no circumcision, there was none of that. The Holy Ghost fell on him as he did us at the beginning. And he said, I'm going to tell you that by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, these Gentiles are saved. And they established something that day in the church. They really did. They laid the foundation. And so, and they won out. And so they sent the message back to the believers in Antioch, which were Gentile believers. And the message was this. That you abstain from meat strangled, offered to idols, and from uh, uh, fornication, and uh, something else. I forget that. I think there's three things. Eating blood. Eating blood. Blood. Thank you, brother. Eating blood. That's it. They said, if you do this, you'll do well. Where's the law of Moses? Where's the Sabbath? Where's the circumcision? Not there. And that's as plain as it can be in Acts 15. You don't have to do that. You have been justified by faith Amen. through the grace of God. Right. All right. Now, listen carefully. The Apostle Peter was the one who, who stood up and said that. And James was the Lord's brother, well respected by the people. It says that James was called James the Just. And I have every reason to believe he's the one who wrote the book of James. And so when they, and so when they went back and they, they went back with this, uh, it, it, was, it was settled. It was settled. It was settled. And I'm sure they had some dissenters, and I'm sure, you know, as always, you know, some separated themselves and what have you, but they didn't make it. <laughs> they didn't make it. The church understood Ephesians chapter number 2, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's a powerful statement. Hallelujah to God. That's powerful. But it wasn't over. Because... Peter came under the sway of some of these Judaizers, and they had, uh, they had, uh, uh, he had, he had, he had been eating with Gentiles, and now because of their influence and so forth, uh, he uh, he separated himself from the Gentiles, and, and the Apostle Paul confronted him in the book of Galatians. Go read it. He confronted him. He said, "I should." He said he he needed to be confronted, and he did. And so, what does that say to you? What does that say to you? We have Peter and Barnabas, and we have Paul. We have these leaders, and they're good men. I don't say anything bad about Peter. If, if I could untie his shoes, I'd be doing well. Uh, he was, he, he, he was, he's God's, his epistles, First and Second Peter, are two of the most wonderful books in the New Testament. But the Holy Spirit records this historical event. Why does he do it? He wants you to know that the Holy Spirit was guiding them into all truth. The Holy Spirit was there when this problem came up. And it was a big one. It's a big one. If somebody comes to you and says, well, you've got to keep the Sabbath, or you've got to keep the law, or you've got to be circumcised, or you can't be saved. What do you do? You say, well, I believe in the Lord Jesus. Well, good, I'm glad you do. I do too, but now you've got to do this too. We've got a problem, right? We've got a problem. We really do. And so what happened? Well, Paul confronted Peter. And when he confronted him, he confronted him about that issue. And, and of course, Peter, being the man of God that he was, and the prophet that he was, and the apostle that he was, uh, he, he acquiesced. He gave in. He agreed. Uh, he, 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 can, uh, he, he accepted. The Bible said, rebuke a righteous man. He loved you for it. And that's what happened. He did. But the Bible, the Holy Ghost records it for you. Why does he record it for you? There's two or three things going on here. Number one, it shows you that when the Apostle Paul, he said, I was taken into Arabia. I didn't receive my doctrine from men. What does he say? He said he didn't consult with flesh and blood, did he? No, not humanity. Even though these are genuine apostles we're talking about in Jerusalem. He said, I didn't consult with them. I went into Arabia. He said, what I got, I got directly from God. All right, so what we have now is a confirmation of authority. And even Peter, in his epistle, talks about many things be hard, hard to be understood, talking about Scripture. Scripture's not, in some places, not easy, folks. You're not reading a Mickey Mouse magazine here. It's not something that you can lay under a microscope and dissect. It's something that's revealed by the Holy Spirit, uh, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. The Apostle Peter said, this, this Scripture, he's talking about the Word of God. He says, and Paul, our beloved brother Paul, and also in his writings, as in other Scriptures. 
the Apostle Peter called Paul's writing Scripture, the Word of God. He gave his confirmation. He gave his approval. So what does that say? Well, it says this. It says that when God called Paul and affirmed in him, he didn't get a perfect man. Paul was not a perfect man. He wasn't a perfect man when he left this world, but he was a man of God. And he was a man that was absolutely uh, uh, saved by the grace of God and kept by the power of God. But when he picked up that pen and he began to write, First, Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, First and Second Thessalonians, First and Second Timothy, Titus, Philemon, and probably Hebrews. When he wrote those books, he was writing revelation from God. He was writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and he was writing where nobody would ever try to come and counter what he said. So I said all that to say this: He's going to tell you about mysteries that nobody else knew anything about. He's going to tell you about things that none of them knew. And so when the Lord reveals these things, the first thing he has to do is reveal himself. And the one who reveals the Son is the Father. And so what we're going to find as we study the second advent is the progressive revelation of the Son by the Father to those who believe. And that's where we are. If in here this morning you believe the Lord Jesus Christ is God then you got that from the Father and not men. I got a thing the other day in the, in, on the prayer page. It's uh, on the Internet. And uh, this, person, this person was complaining bitterly about a certain church that preaches that everybody's going to hell but them. Somewhere up north, I think, somewhere, I don't know. But everybody's going to go to hell but them. And then here's what she said. She says, but they don't even believe that Jesus is God. Now think about that. Is he God? You see, the problem is there are not three gods, just one. But he manifests himself in three different ways, and he does this in time. In time. In time. I said all of that's important. Chronology is very important when it comes to the issue of the revelation of the essence of God. Now, has he revealed himself completely? Well, the book of Hebrews says, God who at sundry times in divers manners spake in time fast to the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. He speaks in the book of Hebrews by his Son. But do we understand him fully? No. Do we have a... Do, is, is there any human being on this earth that has a complete grasp of the essence of God? Well, of course not. Why, good not know. That's why the Bible said we'll see him as he is. We don't even have a complete grasp of, of the essence of the Lord Jesus. I just know he's God Almighty. <laughs> I know he's the creator. But I know what he created came forth from the Father. So what does that say about the Father? I just say he's in a mysti mystical essence and being that I cannot comprehend because then I try to take in the fullness of the Godhead and I can't do it. Amen. Amen. But I know the Lord Jesus Christ is God. No doubt in my mind about it. Thomas said, Lord, put here, the Lord said, put here, reach into thy finger. Thomas said, my Lord and my God. It's quite a mouthful from a Jew. <laughs> All right. So now, then when he really, when did he really begin to manifest himself in his Godhood? Was it during the kingdom of heaven or during the kingdom of God? During the revelation of the kingdom of heaven or the revelation of the kingdom of God? It was the revelation of the kingdom of God. That's when they began to get a hold of who he was in his essence. As the Messiah, he does something. Okay? As the Son of God, he is something. See the difference? God doesn't have to do a thing to be God. And if he does anything... It does not add to nor detract from his stature one whit. Because one of those Old Testament doctrines that are that's so great, he says, I am the Lord thy God, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Immutability. All right, so is he coming again? He's coming again. I'll stop here. I'm getting tired. I need to go back and sit down and rest a minute.
I've covered a lot of ground with you, though, and we'll get into it. I try to lay it out in a kind of a panoramic perspective so you'll see how things go together and you'll see how the Gospels fit with the epistles. And the epistles are the wives of the apostles. Just kidding, folks. I'm glad I'm saved, aren't you? Amen. Brother McLeod, dismiss us, would you please?